This is on the Michigan Senate floor. State Senator Mallory McMorrow had to respond, and I think, or she didn't have to. A lot of lawmakers wouldn't. Yeah, I think she sort of refreshingly responded with yeah. just like putting these little creeps where they belong. Because one of her colleagues, uh, Senator Dana Thies, Thies, not sure how to pronounce it, but she is a Republican uh, in the state Senate in Michigan as well. And she has been fundraising off of Senator McMorrow's pro-LGBTQ rhetoric, which is now uh, under attack, calling her a groomer of children, which is just like, all right, going straight for the most uh, uh, insane and offensive accusation. And some Democrats are just like, all right, they're crazies. I'm going to let this slide. But McMorrow here did not. Thank you, Mr. President. I didn't expect to wake up yesterday to the news that the senator from the 22nd district had overnight accused me by name of grooming and sexualizing children in an email fundraising for herself. So I sat on it for a while wondering why me? And then I realized because I am the biggest threat to your hollow, hateful scheme. Because you can't claim that you are targeting marginalized kids in the name of, quote, parental rights if another parent is standing up to say no. So then what? Then you dehumanize and marginalize me. You say that I'm one of them. You say she's a groomer. She supports pedophilia. She wants children to believe that they were responsible for slavery and to feel bad about themselves because they're white. Well, here's a little bit of background about who I really am. Growing up, my family was very active in our church. I sang in the choir. My mom taught CCD. One day our priest called a meeting with my mom and told her that she was not living up to the church's expectations and that she was disappointing. My mom asked why. Among other reasons, she was told it was because she was divorced and because the priest didn't see her at mass every Sunday. So where was my mom on Sundays? She was at the soup kitchen with me. My mom taught me at a very young age that Christianity and faith was about being part of a community, about recognizing our privilege and blessings and doing what we can to be of service to others, especially people who are marginalized, targeted, and who had less often unfairly. I learned that service was far more important than performative nonsense like being seen in the same pew every Sunday or writing Christian in your Twitter bio and using that as a shield to target and marginalize already marginalized people. I also stand on the shoulders of people like Father Ted Hesburgh, the longtime president of the University of Notre Dame, who was active in the civil rights movement, who recognized his power and privilege as a white man, a faith leader, and the head of an influential and well-respected institution and who saw black people in this country being targeted and discriminated against and beaten and reached out to lock arms with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he was alive, when it was unpopular and risky and marching alongside them to say, we've got you to offer protection and service and allyship to try to right the wrongs and fix injustice in the world. So who am I? I am a straight, white, Christian, married, suburban mom who knows that the very notion that learning about slavery or redlining or systemic racism somehow means that children are being taught to feel bad or hate themselves because they are white is absolute nonsense. No child alive today is responsible for slavery. No one in this room is responsible for slavery. But each and every single one of us bears responsibility for writing the next chapter of history. Each and every single one of us decides what happens next and how we respond to history and the world around us. We are not responsible for the past. We also cannot change the past. We can't pretend that it didn't happen or deny people their very right to exist. I am a straight, white, Christian, married, suburban mom. I want my daughter to know that she is loved, supported, and seen for whoever she becomes. I want her to be curious, empathetic, and kind. People who are different are not the reason that our roads are in bad shape after decades of disinvestment or the, that healthcare costs are too high or that teachers are leaving the profession. I want every child in this state to feel seen, heard, and supported, not marginalized and targeted because they are not straight, white, and Christian. 
We cannot let hateful people tell you otherwise to scapegoat and deflect from the fact that they are not doing anything to fix the real issues that impact people's lives. And I know that hate will only win if people like me stand by and let it happen. So I want to be very clear right now. Call me whatever you want. I hope you brought in a few dollars. I hope it made you sleep good last night. I know who I am. I know what faith and service means and what it calls for in this moment. We will not let hate win. Boom. Like, I mean, did she even take a breath? <laughs> it was like so, it was so good. And that's the, like, the, the concept that, yes, children today are not responsible for race uh, slavery uh, or, or um, you know, that, that is the straw man that the right sets up. The fact that she blew it over aggressively so is helpful because it, it, it reframes the conversation. But we do, as she said, have a responsibility for how we teach that history in the present. Well, yeah, she she makes a good point when she says we need to write the next chapter, and you can't write the next chapter without an understanding of what happened in the previous chapters, because otherwise you start writing this chapter and, and you start having to ask these questions like, hey, why are certain groups more economically uh, and civilly uh, or less economically and civilly secure than other groups? I guess we'll just not address that, right? Well, it's because yeah. we have inheritances off like literal financial inheritances from these unequal times b that have basically been baked into the structure of this stuff. So, I mean, she's obviously right. And that's the exact, this is the energy we need to be um, uh, directing at, at these like sort of Chris Rufo freaks is they are just sniveling little um, uh, uh, cowards or freaks that want to mythologize history and act like any sort of challenge to that is some sort of self exercise and self hate as, opposed to just understanding the world that you live in and the community, like she says, that you're trying to help. The Yeah, a denial of inheritance also leads to the exact kinds of divisions that help right-wing politicians. Because when you don't have an understanding of that inheritance, what do you think about why black people are poorer in this country than white people on average. This is why you yeah, have to start talking about the bell curve uh, when it comes to black people, or you need Charles Murray like again to come up and start having cultural uh, yes. pathologies that explain it. Black culture that. makes them inherently less, uh, uh, they're not able to fit into society yeah. in the same way. It's they don't have the IQ that white people do. Yeah, right. it's because they sick their pants. They train, th that this kind of thinking trains racism it makes it a lot it's a much more fertile much more fertile soil for racism and that's the the, the exact reason why republicans in this country are capitalizing on this and i also want to make this other point too um I, i've evolved on my atheism because i one in part by talking to michael a little bit but two it, the athe religion is not the problem <laughs> in and of itself it is the use of religion to exacerbate inequities and further bigotry and casting aside people who are religious and who ha may have faith means you're also casting aside people like mallory mcmorrow's mother who was at a soup kitchen yeah and 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 particularly like the big problem is that it is about the community and particularly like and I I was uh, I've never I haven't really believed in God my entire adult life, um, but I also am aware of like the sort of direction that new atheism take took it was basically being a. Uh, uh, um, a sort of defender of American foreign policy in the Middle East, yeah. basically saying that Muslims are uh, Islamo-fascists. Primitive, to need to be democratized. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like that was clearly an awful thing. And I think a big problem with atheism and um, that I think most atheists, if they're honest with themselves, understand is like it does what you do with uh, withdraw from the community um, there. And 
for a lot of people, that's fine um, because that community isn't that great, right? There's a lot of homophobia and stuff like that in in, in certain churches. So, like, I understand, like, not wanting to go the specific um, community that um, modern churches provide. Yet, community is still important, and to the extent that religion survives for as long, it's because it actually does sort of have those things. Up, um, it has the community element a part of it, and of course, like the um, the power justification part of it is another reason it survives from the powerful. But the reason people like it is because of the community part. Because of it. right, in in the absence of actual infrastructure in this country and social safety nets that provide for people, I mean, like, I, what's me? Who are we to say? And I know this is a little off topic, but that that a church can't provide a similar function for people than say, you know some of the social programs that like the Black Panthers were trying to build in the 60s for their cities. I mean, it's a different situation, yeah. but like when they are, when it's in, when th these are community-based social safety nets in a society that casts aside everybody and provides you with no healthcare and no wages and stuff, I think it's an arrogant perspective from a lot of like big city liberal atheists to claim that, in, these are in, all inherently wrong. Yeah, I mean, atheists should have their own soup kitchens. If like if Richard Dawkins was serious about organizing like ten years ago or whatever, um, I mean, there is the problem with the 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 sort of like long term problem with having churches take care of this stuff is they start to get patriarchal about saving souls and stuff like yes. that. Um, yes. And so like, you don't want to have uh, some, uh, right? Like, would, are they going to help a gay person or a trans person ex church? Like, you know, who knows about that? Totally. But, um, no, but, but yeah, yeah, like the, but the, but the register she's speaking in is, in, is, is exactly right. Um, and really, really impressive. I think. I agree. My point is just broad strokes. Uh, discounting of churches and religious organizations within smaller communities, frankly, sometimes comes off as uh, elitist out of touch. Yeah, it's like, it, it's because it, it's like you're only going halfway. You're realizing like the limitations of these things without realizing like you need to have something to replace it mm -hmm. with. Right. Will from Indiana, Senator McMorrow seems like if Shiv Roy gained a soul. <laughs> As a ginger, I'm allowed to make that joke. In all seriousness, no, uh, sis, no, bleh. in all seriousness, though, absolutely great speech, and she really outlined what we can do to stop the right wing mindset of what American society should be and write a better future. As she said so well, left is best. Lurking profit. Atheists do have their own soup kitchen, and they don't proselytize to people in exchange for food. Okay. Do they though? I was about to say, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, cer I'm certain there is probably some limited ones, but um, not to the extent that organized religion does. Um, I, I mean, if if it comes, if atheists have organized even a fraction of the like soup kitchens um, as like even the Catholic churches, I'll be very impressed, uh, and I'd like to hear about it. But I'm skeptical. 